<coughs> Morning all. Thanks for tuning in. It's a lovely sunny day and um, I've got an axe that I need to make. Um, we're just about to start the hunter gatherer course and during that course we chop down a tree with a flint axe. So um, I'm going to hopefully extract a flint axe from within this. Then I'm going to explore finding a suitable piece of wood to make a handle for it. And um, we'll fit that axe head in there and also add some uh, shock absorbing uh, factors to it as well. So let's see what we can do. Start off with something nice and heavy. I'm instantly seeing that this is the best of the length and this is the width. So basically what I've got to do is take everything away that isn't the axe. There's a few places you could start. Um, it's got a bit of a dip in the middle of this side. So that makes everything around it the higher, higher than the centre of the bowl. Um, so that's all got to come away. And on this side, it's not so bad. Um, but how do you make a decision where to start? Well, you can start pretty much any way you like. As long as you don't hit um, as long as you don't hit a surface which is oval. You've got to go into a flat or a concavity really. Um, so there's a few there's a few opportunities laying here. I'm gonna start right here. And the reason for that is because I can see what's going on. It's had a little flake already degenerated. And I won't need to hit that too hard, but what I have just been doing is moving this hammer stone around to make the point that I'm going to hit the flint with. Um, kind of, it's the leading point now. Otherwise, if we turn that round, that point's missing. It's out of the way. Hey, plus, you come to watch. It's always good to have a companion. Right, you ready? <laughs> Looking nice inside, so that's always good. What you'll notice is I'm going to take my time. each time we hit the flakes we'll have a little clean up otherwise we're going to end up with bits going in our legs and in our hands and what you might also notice is that every time I hit the flint I turn it over and see what I've done but the flake scar itself gives me a way to move forward you'll get you'll get the gist of that as we go forward It gets a little narrow up this end, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop the back end of that off in an advantageous fashion look. So now I can hit that and remove this cap, which already seems like it's slightly coming adrift from a thermal crack. That's a handy flake there. So actually what we've done is we've come right down one side now. There's such a lot of width on this, I might as well use some of that to my advantage. So This stage is called roughing out. 
where you're gaining your control over the actual random shape of the stone and that's probably the bit that people find a little bit challenging but hopefully you can see this little formula is quite easy to follow that was the impact point of the last flake this is the width of that flake plan so I'm going to go somewhere near the middle Hopefully you'll also notice that A, the hammer stone being quartzite is standing up to the job quite well but um, we're never really lifting it very high away from the job and we're not whacking it in such a fashion where it's like an accident, it's quite a controlled, controlled removal. There's going to come a point soon where this has outgrown um, outgrown the, the actual situation, we won't need the power of that weight. We've just about come all the way around this now, look. Last little bit to deal with here. feeling that this is a good point to change over. That's quite a jump. We really should have an intermediate one here, but um, I intend to now move over to combining a hammer stone and a soft hammer. And that's because we're all the way round. And this will slow down the scale reduction of the actual size of the piece of flint. Okay, so that's stage one done. So stage two of um, the balancing of this whole stone is by observing what's high and what's low. So this is a high crest, but this one is higher, so that slightly has a priority over that one. But also we have to remember that this is a dual sided dual sided um, stone. So I'm going to have a look around. Now this heavy crest line runs back to here and this actual area here is actually 90% set up as far as shape goes. So the benefit that I'll get from that is from a very small amount of effort we're just um, we're shaping this area to become a platform like this look. So the soft hammer's idea is to kiss that right there and send this little flake along here. Although where it gets higher we could bump into that and hinge. So I'm going to put the, take the flake off in such a fashion that I'm not really trying to go for too much distance. Fine. I'll make this my next one because again I've got a fortuitous shape at the side of the stone so I don't need to do a lot here we go
hammer stone's letting me down a bit. But. You get different types of hammer stones. Some of them are better off as abraders because they're quite granular. And this almost looks, it's not quite even quite sandstone, it's, like, it's kind of a field spa, but uh, can be a good abrader. These are all balancing shots really, just to get all these high spots off. Probably going to drop down to this soft hammer, because this one's a bit disorganised and goes around the corner. And um, well, that's much straighter. A nice flake, look at that. Beautiful. That, that flake was actually able to do that like that because it didn't bump into anything. You know, high, high bumps, it's got a lovely crest down its back. So when you look at where, where we were pushing that from, lovely. Quite an acoustic journey through this stone with all the bell type shaped sounds. Apart from the birds singing and the road noise, if you're listening to flint napping, you can quite often tell just from the sound of the napping how the napping's going. You can make a stone, you can make what you're making go out of balance and um, you can even mildly bend a stone, and that's when things get dangerous. But this is all going well. You have to be a bit careful that you don't make the surfaces too flat. Because if they get too flat, then the flakes that are sent off haven't got any content to them, so they broaden out and they all finish um, in an unsatisfactory fashion. And you can and you can keep you can prevent yourself from um, making it too flat quite simply by um, lifting the back of the flint up a little. That's good. This line's becoming nice and organised now. Um, 
I'll do the same with this then, and then we'll start bringing in and bringing in and forming the head of the axe. The intended um, tree for this axe is going to be a sweet chestnut tree and we'll be making, um, primarily we'll be using the uh, tree for uh, sweet chestnut bark containers. You can also use all the wood that you don't um, require for uh, the bark containers and you can boil it up and you make a very nice tannin solution for uh, your deer skins, get a lovely colour. coming together isn't it? Where these edges become really thin, that's one of the reasons why we draw them back. If you're just whacking something that's really thin, you just it's just going to collapse in front of you at this stage anyway. So we draw it back so it's more advantageously, after a want of a set of words, positioned to this side of the flint. And that's creating Nice quality flakes look. It's um, I'm in the process in my mind now, I'm thinking of the handle this is going into. So I don't want any lumps and bumps which is going to go into that um, tapered, tapered recess into the handle and uh, give me hollow spots. So it's quite important I get it balanced. one that I wanted. And I went to the fact that this is going to be uh, best described as a rough out. That means that I'm not going to polish this axe. I need to make sure that all the flakes from the front end are discharged nicely.
can kind of brush with this and that will give me a, a nice organised um, flake, well hopefully I'll get that to shift so why did I come off the side of the leg? Well, I'm bracing with a little finger under here, look, and that really helps with your guiding and your steering and maintaining and containing shocks. You get really sensitively in touch with what's going on at the base of that hammer. That's if you can hit it where you want to. There you have it, there's the axe head. Should do the job, shouldn't it? So now it's time to go and find the handle. Now some time ago I had the opportunity to get some um, nice U and uh, I have a stash of it just here. This is what we've been doing all the uh, U-bows with, which has been great fun, as it still is. Um, but underneath there I've stored up some timber which I never really believed was going to become a bow. And we need a reasonable size piece, um, fairly straight, slightly tapered, and hopefully with a knot at the top. Okay, so down here I've got a piece um, that's looking... Well, it's looking too good for an axe handle really. There's a good bow there, but I want an axe, so I'm going to use it. And the position of this knot here, you can imagine what it's going to do to all the grain at the top. So, if I was to put a hole in here, cut all this back and round that head off, that would be a real good security for the top of the axe handle. Um, hopefully stopping it splitting when we use it. Um, now I could do that with flint tools, uh, but that would take me the rest of the day. So I'm going to show you how I do it in the workshop um, with a drill and a couple of chisels. Well, excuse the state of my workshop. Um, it's been a mess in here. I've been getting uh, ready for this uh, hunter-gatherer course that we're running with all the U-bow staves. Um, but we'll make the best of it. I suppose you have to imagine with all these things that um, if you don't use any modern equipment whatsoever all these jobs are going to take a hell of a lot longer so what I'll do is I'll reduce some of the uh, thickness of this as well probably on the bandsaw take the front of that off, chamfer this top and then we'll look at some drills and some chisels to do that Okay, let's just assume for a moment then that I don't have that and um, we want to get through here. I would then be forced to consider such a thing as this, look, it's a burin which has been placed in a drill and maybe using the big flake that we discharged during the manufacture of the axe itself. And that would be um, quite a long-winded approach 
of um, rotary drilling in such a fashion. But um, rather than boring my way through this wood, and probably boring you to death in the process, but that would do its job. So it's quite happy to go in there. But that would be um, a good evening's work. Just by itself. So, and then the trimming with, with this, you know, literally cutting through this lot. But that would take a while, so um, let's uh, set about it with a drill like this. Visualising that to go in there. Yeah, so I've got that in the right place. In the middle. Oops. It's a good job that came out because now what we do is we'll use something somewhat smaller, that one, and we'll go in either side and then what we'll do is we'll get a rounded chisel and we'll chase that through. So I'll plow on with that and once I've got that all reined out and the axe head going in I'll show you how I'm going to support that axe head in there and what I'm going to fix it with. So a full hour and a half later, we've now got this hole fairly well trafficking through there. I'm just going to set that in a fraction deeper to that. But then before I actually just think about that completely finishing there, in there, what I'm going to do is I've cut a little bit of buckskin out. I'm going to lay that on, I'll wrap that round and stitch that up onto that and then once it's stitched on and this uh, glue is ready here, this is, um, this is pine resin with beeswax and stirred in charcoal powder, I'll actually completely dip the back of the axe straight into there and then I'll push that into that axe head and then we'll move on from there ok then that's going in there nice and snug now so bring it around to this pot there we go so this is pretty hot stuff and I've got to be a bit careful as I handle this because I have had this spilt on me before and um, that's not an everyday pleasure I can tell you important as it goes off it doesn't build up too much bulk as well bring back this handle get that in there and then literally now there's one or two areas around here where I could drift a little bit more resin in I've got that suitably in there nice and tight and um, and then I've got one more thing I want to add to this. So here we are some three hours later and um, we have an axe, looks uh, like it could do the job but one of my considerations for an axe like this is the top 
is supported by that knot. We've got a well, um, we've got a well set in axe head into that handle. But it's the bottom that I'm worried about now. This bottom can quite easily just as, just as easily split. So I've got I've got a um, strip of veg tanned leather. It's about an inch wide. Just soaked it up a little. And I reckon that we can probably give this axe just a little bit of support. A little bit more support just by strapping this on here. I'll strap on really tight. has got to give this handle just a little bit more go about itself. Well do I think. It's nice and tight on there. I'll just put a little bit of um, glue over that as well. That's just going to hold that there permanently. So what's left to do is um, chop the tree down with it. Gonna be a fun exercise, isn't it? Yeah. If you watch that all the way to the end, then um, I must be doing something right, I guess. But <laughs> there you go. If it doesn't drop a tree down, we'll have a new set of questions to ask, won't we? Cheers for now. Thanks for watching.